Video check. Loud and clear. KSL Sports and KSL Podcast present Mode Push, an American view of F1, starting now. Don't stop. He's let you get with his Honestly. I've guessed it. I've absolutely guessed it. I enjoy this so much. Thank you. Thank you. everybody welcome on in it is of course mode push an american view of f1 it is our podcast that we uh we love to talk about f1 and we're american that's not the prerequisite of course of to be on this program but it helps that we both are since that's in the uh in the tagline there dan jimenez my co-host as usual joining me over the ether dan what's up man how was your race weekend I was good. Oh, Canada. I, it was an entertaining weekend. The The rain came like we had predicted and made uh, qualifying spicy, at least. So I had this moment where I I have the F1. I have the F1 app. You know, I have like the TV pro or whatever it is. And it's almost exclusively so that I don't get spoilers. So they don't put they, they won't put they'll just be like, hey, right. And you can you can hit it and it'll say start from the beginning and no one will ruin it for you. OK, that's like hoping that my kid doesn't tell me who won uh, before the race <laughs> happened, right? But I had this weird moment where the I, I like shut the app for a minute when something was happening at home, and I turned it back on, and I see the wet still, and I'm like, oh, my gosh, this race changed big time. And I'm looking, and the order was just getting crazy. And then I realized, I'm like, these turns look really weird. What is going on here? I was It, it somehow booted up Monaco from this year. And it totally <laughs> threw me for a loop. I was like, I'm staring at the screen going, oh, my gosh, I can't believe that Checo is in 18th. But it also made sense a little bit, like, storyline-wise. <laughs> and I, 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 like, had to convince myself, like, no, 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 the rain didn't suddenly hit. And in qualifying, of course, we, you know, Haas ended up getting hit with the with, with the grid penalty. But with Hulkenberg number two, like, if you would have ever said that guy was going to qualify second, and, of course, the American team ends up doing nothing on Sunday, but – Dream podium for F1 fans, maybe, I guess, when you have 11 total world championships up on the podium with Max running away with this thing again with a bird in his brake ducks, and then uh, Fernando Alonso at two, and then uh, and then Lewis Hamilton and Mercedes have still figured some things out in three. Was that the thing that you were like, yes, I love that kind of podium, or was it was it less like that because Max still was so dominant this weekend? Yeah, it, I think it was a bit of a tricky race because he was so dominant and he was never like not in, in you know, in it uh, all kind of sealed up to win. But at the same time, like Aston, he wasn't running away from him. You know, he finished nine and a half seconds a- ahead of Alonzo where Alonzo was having to do the lift and coast thing that the team was telling him to do, which we can talk more about. But uh I mean, he didn't, he didn't win by 20 seconds. He didn't win by 40 seconds. So I, I, the race pace analysis is coming back, showing that the gap is closing between Mercedes Aston and, and Red Bull. So even though Max clearly won this weekend, uh, you know, maybe the bird and the brake duck was affecting <laughs> him a little bit. Um, he did have that one off where he hit the sausage curve and almost pulled a George Russell into the Ooh. wall there. Uh, so I, I, I think that it was a positive direction in terms of competitiveness, uh, what I saw this weekend. So you ended up with uh, with that dream podium. Any other, like, real shock, surprise performances? I think that McLaren has figured some stuff out quietly because we also – it's like in this weird spot where we don't really talk about them. It's like they're not – terrible enough for us to make fun of and they're not good enough for us to really kind of give them any props have they figured something out of mclaren that we're not really giving them credit for uh, potentially it's it's yeah they're kind of in this weird middle range that we can't quite declare it as they're on their way back or not um and uh i think what we're seeing is a lot of talent out of uh oscar and lando i mean oscar's uh Almost neck and neck. I think Lando has finished ahead of Oscar in two races, uh, two more races this year. Uh, And I think that McLaren has to be happy about the trade that they've made with Daniel Ricciardo, who could not keep up with Lando last year. So I think on the driver front, uh, it's positive. And on the performance front, uh, like all the other teams, they're making incremental uh, improvements. And so um, I think things are looking positive. But I I mean, we can't uh, go without mentioning that. 
Albon and the Williams team in that uh, seventh place finish, I think is the highest they've finished in the last two years. Uh, it's really cool to see that team celebrate and get all you know excited and amped ab- about their finish. And uh, I, it, it's interesting how well uh, Canada plays into Mercedes setup. Uh, and, you know, he was able to just keep himself in front of that DR- DRS train, even though he didn't have DRS, he was fast in a straight line and nobody could get around him. So if uh, I think as we come back to other tracks like Monza and other high speed tracks like Canada, uh, we'll probably see Williams come back up to the top. And it's a bummer that Sargent was out after a few laps because he he was saying that the car was really solid and he probably could have made um, a push for the points. Uh, but yeah, he, you know, had his issue in the first few laps. Seventh place for Alex Albon. I think that that puts them ahead of Alpha Tauri. I think in the in the constructors overall. And um, I don't know. Albon is is one of those guys that that's pretty hard to not like. It's it's also kind of a guy that you have figured out over the years that just was not a Red Bull dude. <laughs> it just doesn't seem like he has no, that cutthroat yeah. uh, the cutthroat culture that they kind of anticipate you having at Red Bull. They like it. They expect you to always be fighting for your seat, even if, like, I mean, Checo, a guy who's in second place right now in the World Drivers' Championship right now, and admittedly has not had great races, obviously, over the the past uh, three or four races, um, and it's hard when you're racing against maybe one of the best racers we've seen ever, right? I mean, we're watching we're watching uh, history be made. He, I think he uh, he equaled Ayrton Senna's uh, uh, win record or win totals in his career, uh, along with the 100th win overall at Red Bull. And Checo, like, what didn't participate in any of those discussions because he was no, he was you know he finished sixth or whatever it was, and he feels like he's going to lose his gig. Am I crazy to think that Helmut Marco would be? Uh, would kick that dude to the curb immediately after the season. Cause uh, certainly his contract is up uh, at the end of this one. No, that's not crazy to think at all. And when you have Daniel Ricardo sitting in the wings, that's just an immediate easy answer. Uh, you know, not even considering all the other uh, interesting drivers that could become available. Yeah. Sergio, it starts with Saturday qualifying. We talked about it last time. He's in his head. He's in his own head. He's not getting into Q3 uh, like he should be. And he's not really like this rain master that we thought he was. And so, uh, yes, the heat is on Sergio, uh, big time. And you thinking about Albon, like, where does he go from here? You know, what, what success look, look, look like for him. I don't think it's to stay at Williams long-term. I think he's looking to show that he can get the most out of a car and, you know, you're looking at a Lewis retirement in a, you know, perhaps a few years, and is Al- is Albon trying to position himself with that relationship between Williams and Mercedes for that spot? Or are you trying to attract Leclerc over from Ferrari, uh, who's not having a great time? Uh it's it's gonna be interesting who who lands in that William or in that Mercedes seat. And I think uh, Albon's starting to make a case for himself. When you see uh you know, this weekend the the performances of of some of the midfield teams and are we are we just on our way to not seeing anything fun the rest of the year? The the possibility of Max Verstappen winning the rest of the races the rest of the year. Are we crazy talking about it at this point? Not crazy to talk about it, but I I I think that Mercedes and Aston Martin are getting closer and closer and the the second half of the year uh I'm feeling good about the the Le- more of a level playing field and competitiveness. Now it's probably going to take either something freaky happening on Saturday and, um, you know, uh, Max not starting on pole or something happening during the race. But uh, I think it's at the point now where Max can't even blink or sneeze without uh, <laughs> Aston being right up there on him and, and Mercedes as well. You know, we're talking about Lewis a lot, but, you know, George, he, you know, was in fourth when he, when he wrecked, I mean, George, that was a bad mistake on his part. Yeah. Uh, but I think he, you know, he was showing uh, equal speed to Lewis as well there at the beginning. And so uh, Mercedes is coming for him. Alonzo's coming for him. We're not uh, obviously saying anything about stroll. I think that's the other thing too, is it's very clear now that Lance is the weak link in the team and is holding them back from real dollars in terms of where they would finish in the championship. And uh, if you're Papa Stroll, as I, I don't know, maybe it never crosses his mind. But being the capitalist that that guy is, 
you have to think like you could attract now to Aston Martin pretty much any talent from the grid that you like want. Who? And are you really like who? You tell me. You tell me. I it mean, would be an amazing pairing with uh, with Nando. I mean, or uh, with uh, yeah. I mean, is it crazy Sorry. to think Charles should uh, go to uh, Aston Martin uh, if Ferrari can't get their act together? I mean, the whole thing is, is everybody wants to see what what Leclerc looks like in a in a top end car. Um, do they feel like they're going to get that next year? I mean. That's the other thing is I, I was I was uh, listening to an interview I think this weekend and they were talking with uh, Lewis Hamilton and he goes, yeah and we've and we've you know obviously started talking a lot about what our development looks like for next year. We have to put together a 2024 car now that's going to be competitive with Max's 2024 car. And he didn't say a thing about Red Bull. He didn't say anything about. He said Max's 2024 car because that's a, that's the only person you know in there. Why not Lewis Hamilton? Being on the same team as Max Verstappen at the end of it, I mean, that sounds insane, and that sounds like it would be just an absolute terrible marriage. But what about, uh, I mean, what about Lando and Nando? What about the the full mm, mm. and Aston Martin uh, duo with, uh, I mean, that, that would actually be amazing. To me, that would be awesome. That's a guy who's being wasted in terms of talent. Lando Norris is, and he's just in such a bad spot right now, right? I mean, those guys... They don't feel good about. He doesn't feel good about things. Zach Brown, that that honeymoon is over. I think uh, for them and his whole th- his love for uh, for Lando Norris. I think that would be a great pairing. He'd obviously have to get out of that contract, but Aston Martin is going in for the kill. And I think you have to find a place where um, where where uh, where uh, Papa Stroll could feel good about putting his kid. Like make a deal. And somebody else has to, but he has to still have a seat in F1. I could see that deal being made as well. Um, I'm pulling up here the uh, contract links for all the drivers. So through 2023, who, who does not have a can- a contract after this year? Uh, Lewis, Lewis, Lewis and George. George, right. Uh, Checo. Uh, Joe Guan Yu. Okay. Yuki. Logan Sargent. Magnuson. And then, uh, oh yeah, where's Checo? Is, even on is Checo two is years? Not... Is he two years? No, I thought no, for... no, no. He's he's done at the end of this year. Yeah, uh, no. It's it's saying here it's in end of twenty twenty four. We're gonna have to fact check that one. Well, uh, I'm pretty I, sure it's the end of this reason, year. For some reason, I felt like he was on the. I mean, he's. I think Red Bull doesn't care either. Like they'll kick you out whenever. But I mean that that might make a difference. But um... so I'm counting seven. If you include Checo, that's eight. Uh, that's a fair amount of drivers that need to get their contracts. But my favorite part of this list is uh, Lance Stroll. It says unknown. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, because you know, oh, because that that's interesting. It's just a deal with his dad, kind of a thing, it's right? Just like a deal, a deal straight made a deal straight with. Yeah, with, check out uh, no, the, check out did he, he signed right after Monaco last year? Another two years. Oh, uh, okay, okay, okay. But again, yep. but again, Helmet Marco only likes one person on that team. It seems like. He doesn't even like. Oh. he doesn't even like Christian Horner. Like Christian Horner feels like he's also on the outs a little bit. But you think about historically what they did this weekend. I mean, Red Bull got their hundredth Grand Prix win. This is a freaking energy drink company. I can't imagine. Think about the teams that are good in F one overall ever. Right? You think about your um, your your heritage teams. You know your Ferraris, your Williams. Uh, Mercedes now, of course, more recent memory, but I mean, like these are names that are car manufacturers, man. And Williams is is synonymous with the, like F one success. They build cars; that's what they do. This is a freaking energy drinks company, and they are maybe going to take over as being that. You know, I mean, just like uh, they're already the unbeatable team, and I just think it's insane historically what they've been able to do with uh, with with their F1 team. It's just it's crazy the amount of commitment they have to making sure that they're going to compete. They are the big dog. They're not one of the big dogs. They are the big dog right now. Yeah, it's incredible to see a media giant like them. I mean, they're they are a soft or a, a sports drink company, but in the end they're a media company, I think. Yeah. And uh I mean, they made an incredible hire with uh, Adrian Newey all those years ago and just ridden that talent and uh that the, the brain power that he brings. Um it's uh yeah it's in, it's incredible to see and a lot of respect helmet marco it's a, that guy's an interesting dude he has a lot of very quotable he ends up in a lot of uh articles uh cuz he'll just say anything he's so but rude. one he's so mean. Is, that guy is so mean 
<laughs> he's ruthless. Uh, he does love Max, and but not enough to let Max drive the Nurburgring. So that was a piece of news I saw this week. So they're going to be doing for the 24 hours of Nurburgring, uh, the Nurburgring, which is uh, that crazy racetrack in Germany that's like a 10-mile track. very, very uh, dangerous as well. But they had it on the yeah. calendar in COVID, right? Like we saw, an, didn't we have a Nurburgring race during COVID? So um, I think during COVID, we had a um, Hockenheim race. Ah. So there's the Nürburgring, and then there's the Nürburgring Norschleife, which is the north loop of the Nürburgring, which is the really long one that people can go out on their rental cars and drive. Sure. So uh, the the World Endurance Championship races 24 hours around that thing, which is crazy enough. But Red Bull is now promoting a, a media stunt um, where Sebastian Vettel is going to get in a Red Bull and drive it around uh, the Norschleife which is going to be really cool to see. But apparently Max wanted to do it and Helmut Marco put the ax on that and said, no, no Max, you can't. Cause number, number one, it's already a super uh, dangerous track do an F1 car around that. And knowing Max wanting to beat some sort of lap time and be the fastest person to ever do the Norse life. I think that that's the right call is do not let the franchise uh, guy go out on that track in the F1 car. I, uh, I would suggest that if you've never gone onto YouTube and just found Nurburgring crashes. I'm not talking about like fatal ones. I'm talking about average dude taking his, uh, I mean, they, they do any, it's like your rented, uh, BMW Z3 people take them out there and they go around these corners. And if there's a little bit of wet on the track, most of these people are not good at, uh, you know, they're not racers, but you just go and it's, you know, it's like that bridge. I think there's a bridge that's famous too, right? That's like, uh, it's like it's like eleven foot nine dot com or something like that. You just go and watch the video of trucks that are too tall hitting this thing. That's what the Nurburgring is for the average person who takes their car out there. It is actually like hilarious. You're like, no, look at this guy. He's got like a station wagon. No, he just wrecked the family station wagon. You know, going around a corner and they just put it in the wall and it's and it, and they're just sitting there with their hands in their head going, oh boy, I'm an idiot. So I would recommend it. And certainly, Helmet Marco doesn't want his uh, his uh, top talent in F1 taking a risk around there. Nürburgring, I think, is where um, – is that where Nicky Lauda got in his fiery accident? I'm almost I – mean, Oh, yeah. Almost yeah. certain of it. That and sounds right. I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure that uh, – I think there, there's a famous yeah. story where he – Yeah, so – People taking a tour around there, and he drove by, and he goes, hey, anybody – Is it, can anybody find my ear over there? <laughs> like, oh, people are like oh, – People Excuse are mortified uh, of the uh, – of the comedy of Nikki Lauda, who's uh, was burned up in a really bad accident there. Anyway. Yeah. We digress. Go ahead. Uh, no. Yeah. So the Nürburgring for a lot of, uh, um, of F1's history, they have kind of switched between Nürburgring, the F1 track, which is just a small portion of the whole thing. Uh, and Hockenheim. Um, and so I think that the one we raced at in COVID where it was, uh, just a wet mess the entire time it was Mercedes. I think it was their big, like 50 year, a hundred year where they all dressed up in the suspenders and it rained out. And then they both, they both wrecked out. That was, uh, that one was at Hockenheim, but, mm. um, so w- next on the schedules, uh, Austria, which is Red Bull's home racetrack, you know, quote unquote, a home track. But I think that, it from what we saw from the upgrades uh, that were brought to Canada and, and the rumors that are flying around, especially coming out of Aston Martin today, there's rumors of Aston Martin saying that in the sim that the, this next set of upgrades coming into Austria is putting them on pace in the sim with Red Bull. How they can get down to that level of detail and certainty uh, as a former simulation engineer, I'm a little uh, uh, speculative of that. Well, tell me but, more about uh, that then. Like, how does that... Like, what does not having that time versus having – it's one thing to say, no, we will have closed the gap because of the discrepancy of how much more time we get. Like, how much information is, like, dire and crucial and amazing that you're able to learn out of that uh, out of that simulation and out of those – or out of the, uh, you know, the wind tunnel that actually gives you that idea? Yeah, so what they'll do is, you know, the – Aerodynamicists will be doing lots of what we've talked about before, like computational uh, aero work, and they'll come up with a new idea for their floor, a new idea for whatever. And then they actually manufacture it and they stick it on a scale model of the car. Then they put that in their wind tunnel. And then from that, they generate a bunch of data. Then they feed that data back into the simulation and they say, okay, race car driver Lance or whatever, get in the sim and drive around 
Austria with this new setting and we'll compare it to the old setting and see how much time you gain. And if you gain half a second, you're like, okay, well, our race pace has been half a second off of Red Bull. We're now apples to apples with them, assuming Red Bull doesn't make a similar a jump in performance between now and then, which of course they're they're going to be working on, but they have less wind tunnel time based on not only where they finished in first place last year, but also the penalty for hitting the cost cap. So the theory is, is that Aston Martin and all these other teams with more development time should catch up. So I think that's where it's coming from is the, just a mix of data that they're getting from um, the computer, from the wind tunnel and, and making these estimates. And so I, I hope they're right. I hope we get to Austria, but man, Max is super fast there. And uh, I feel like that they'll have that home team mojo, uh, home track mojo going with them. Uh, we wait a week and then we get the Austrian GP, as you mentioned, and uh, at the Red Bull ring appropriate for uh although i feel like every it feels like like every track in northern europe is somehow the red bull ring like it just seems like except for silverstone everything everybody who shows up is in all orange it seems like these days at these uh <laughs> at these races so you got the austrian uh gp and then the week after the uh the british gp at uh, silverstone of course uh and then uh, you'll have the hungarian one after that and then i think we're into our no, we still have Belgium, Belgium, and then uh, that's when we get into our uh, month off after that of racing. So you've got four more races until we really start to get interesting with these uh, with these seats that are available. Can Williams be patient with uh, young Logan Sargent? I'm not sure. Is Joe Guan Yu long for uh, F1? I don't know. Uh, how are these seats going to get traded around? I'm uh, fascinated by the whole thing, but. Uh, I don't know where the I don't know where the Austrian GP kind of stacks up against. This feels like one that uh, that's a runaway for Red Bull, also. Yeah, it's like we said, home track, high downforce, uh, high speed, high downforce. There's not really a slow corner. I personally love it. You know, if I'm whatever, get in the little F1 sim and get to drive around. Uh, it's a super fun track because it's really fast the whole time. And, you know, like Alonzo said in, uh, from the Canada race, he described it as running 70 qualifying laps. Uh, it's Austria is going to feel like that too. So it's, it'll be a real test of, um, the driver's endurance, the car's endurance, uh, and we'll play into whoever can balance low drag with high downforce, which has been Red Bull's bread and butter, but Aston and, uh, Martin and Mercedes are catching up. All right. Uh, as we get ready for, uh, another week in the books here, and then we get ready for another set of races in uh in a week and a half or so and so the world uh we'll jump in next week and do a race preview and uh get you ready for austria and get you excited about everything dan thanks for hanging out as usual your uh, expertise is uh the best man we got to get more we got to get more people on this thing man we got to get people going on this we got to find more americans uh getting on drive to survive and uh attack those guys so uh (laughs) thanks for coming on as usual right of course all right, Dan Jimenez, Alex Keery, Mode Push. You can download the podcast wherever you find fine podcasts. You can, uh, of course, find it on kslsports.com. We are a production of KSL Sports and KSL Podcast. So for Dan, I'm Alex. We'll see you next time, everybody.